Welcome to the Gospel Activist Podcast, Ministry of Stepping Out Ministries, where we explore how we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in our modern context. Here is your host, pastor and evangelist, Kevin Henry. Welcome to the Gospel Activist Podcast, and I'm so thankful that you've joined us today to explore this important and yet controversial topic of homosexuality and the gospel. Before we get to our subject matter today, we would really value your input and your comments. So if you would visit us at steppingoutministries.com slash podcast.html, at the bottom of the page, there's a contact form. We invite you to fill that out, and we'd love to hear from you. Any comments you might have, or even any questions you'd like us to address on the show. Our subject matter today is one that has affected my own life and my own family. As my father, when I was a teenager, came out as being a homosexual. And that has affected our whole family uh, both as children, my siblings, my mother, and, and even my wife and, and children. It affects all of our whole family. And so this is even a subject matter that is important to me and is a, a sensitive subject that we as Christians need to address. In order to address that, though, we first have to go to God's Word, the Bible, the ultimate authority on any subject. So before we dialogue on this subject, let's look at what God's Word says on this subject. First we need to look at Genesis 19. You might remember it's a story of Lot and how he had found two strangers and invited him into the, their home. And then the men of the city came and called out to Lot and said, send out your visitors. We know they're there. We want to know them. And to know them means to know them sexually. So we know from that passage that some of the men were doing this abomination of homosexual acts in the city of Sodom. And that is one of the reasons that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. There's more reasons than just that, because it was a wicked city, but homosexuality is one of those reasons why God destroyed it. Then we need to look at Leviticus 18 verse 22, where it says, You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. That passage there again is saying too that homosexuality is wrong and a sin. Leviticus 20 verse 13 says, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. This verse is speaking about how again homosexuality is wrong. In God's eyes it is an abomination, something that is deplorable to God. And the penalty is even says there that they're to be put to death. Now the one thing we need to realize with that passage is that even in the Old Testament, in Old Testament times, people just didn't go off doing justice on their own. Justice still happened with a forum where you still had a judge. In the Old Testament times, around Moses' time, Moses was one of the judges. And for a time, he has, had also appointed judges to deal with other matters. So it wasn't the general population that were putting homosexuals to death. It would have been only been the governing authorities. So even our day and age now, for us as Christians, we don't put homosexuals to death. We preach and teach that it's wrong and that it's sin, but it's up to the state to deal with justice issues. And so if we had a law against homosexualities, it would be up to the government to handle that issue. It's not for us as Christians to go and make the person change or or put them to death. That's the state's job to deal with discipline in those matters. Our role as a Christian is to warn the homosexual of how their actions is sin and how that keeps them away from relationship with God. Some of the other passages that we look at regarding the subject is 1 Timothy 1, verse 8 through 11. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. 
Let me stop there for a moment. The point of God's law is for those who break it. Again, the point of the law is to show us that we are sinful and that we are in need of a Savior. So that's why Paul says here that the law is for those who are lawless and disobedient, uh, ungodly, sinners, unholy and profane. Paul continues on when he says, For those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, with which I have been entrusted. So here in this passage, there's a list of sins that Paul is saying that that's why God's law has been written for these people, so they understand that they're breaking God's law. Homosexuality is one of the things in this list here. Liars is one, perjurers another, children who are disrespectful to their parents by striking them. These are all things that are unholy and profane before God. So this is again a reminder though that the homosexual is also profaning God. Another passage we look at regarding this subject is Romans 1 verse 26 through 32. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. I'm going to stop there for a second. God gave them up to their dishonorable passions. That means that because a person is determined on worshipping idols that are not true gods, putting them before God instead, God allowed them to be handed over to their own passions. In other words, to hand it over to their own sins. And here's what Paul describes them. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Let me stop there for a moment. Here Paul is clearly describing the homosexual and that there is even a, a penalty for their error. We'll get to what that penalty is in a moment. Paul continues in verse 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what they ought not to be done. They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedience to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Now we get to some of what the consequences of being a homosexual and homosexual acts comes to. Paul says here in verse 32 that they deserve to die. Well, truth be told, we actually all deserve to die for our sins. But that's why Jesus came, died in our place. Paul speaks to that same thing a little further in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11. For do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul asks this question as a rhetorical one to bring to mind to remember that there's consequences for our sin. And that sin means that we don't get to inherit the kingdom of God. We don't get to be in heaven with God. Paul continues, do not be deceived. We see throughout this world that there are many people who are deceived on this very subject. That they approve, like it says in Romans, they approve and say that this lifestyle is okay. When God says it's wrong, it's sin, it's an abomination. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 6. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, and you were sanctified, 
you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There's some important notes here in this passage. Here's a list of people. It's not just sin, but actual lifestyles. Because we notice here that some of these words refer to lifestyles. So it's not just even the practice, it's the choosing of saying, hey, God created me as a homosexual. It's that kind of mentality that they were born that way. When God's saying that that is a sin, it's not possible for someone to be born gay. Now there may be some things in their life that lead towards that possibly, but still, it's still a choice. No one is born that way. The world will have us believe that they are born that way, but it's not true. There is no scientific evidence to that at all. And in fact, the evidence is contrary to it. The study was done on twins, on identical twins. And they had found that in some cases where they, there was one twin was homosexual and the other one was straight, they found that it is not possible for it to be genetic. Because twins have the exact same chromosomes, the exact same DNA, because they're identical. They're from the same egg, the same sperm that fertilized the egg. So it's not possible for it to be genetic. Otherwise, both twins would have to be homosexuals 100% of the time for it to be genetic. So the science shows that it is not genetic. So God does not create people homosexual. So God, through Paul, is really speaking to not only the practice, but also the lifestyles of it. It's a wrong mentality. And Paul is saying here, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is very serious here. Paul says in verse 11 then, and such were some of you. That's a key point in this passage here. That's what some used to be. When we become a Christian, that is no longer identity. Someone might be tempted by that still, but if they say that I choose to walk in obedience in God, I choose not to, lo- to live in that lifestyle anymore, no longer to sin in that way, that is far different than someone who says, well, I'm born this way and God accepts me this way. Which again, as we've said, is not true. Temptation and sin are two different things. We are all tempted, but we all have a choice to act upon that thought or not. And Paul is saying that that's what they, some of them used to be. But because they became a Christian, they are no longer those things. They have put those things aside. That's what God asks of us when we come to faith, to put aside our sin. That's what the word repent means, to change our mind about our sin. To turn from it and say, you know what, my sin was wrong, and I choose now to no longer do it because Christ has saved me from my sins. And I love God, and so I don't want to do sinful things anymore. So this is our biblical basis for this subject. That God in his word clearly says that homosexuality is a sin and wrong. In a moment we're going to talk a little bit about how do we treat a homosexual then as a Christian. How are we to treat them? Some of what we're talking about today falls in line a little bit with apologetics. Because sometimes this is a subject that is brought up that talks about how Christians or God is so immoral. This is even a subject that's important for us as Christians to study, to have an answer to give to people. They may not like the answer, but we need to have a good, clear, biblical answer on this subject. I've been developing recently an apologetic seminar called Defending Your Faith. And we're going to be hosting that at our church here starting at the end of October, October 25th at the Evangelical Free Church in Onaway. And so if you would like to come and join us in learning how to defend your faith, we invite you to visit our church website at oefchurch.ca. And on there you can see how to get to our church and our contact information there to get a hold of us to let us know you'd like to be part of that seminar. It's very important for us as Christians to be able to defend our faith, to teach what the Bible really teaches, so we can lead people towards Christ and salvation. So again, that website address is oefchurch.ca. Now that we've looked at scripture, we need to turn that now to the practical of how do we treat a homosexual. I think this is one area that sometimes we as Christians have fallen short on. Some Christians treat homosexuals well. They show them the love of Christ. 
But there are some who go to the extreme, who are very hateful towards them. And God says in his word that we're not to be hateful. We are to show love to them. That's why we need to warn them about their sin. But we need to treat them properly. I want to recommend a movie to you called Audacity. It's a, a film done by Ray Comfort and his ministry, Living Waters. And they do a really good job of presenting how Christians should be treating homosexuals, being concerned about their eternal destination. Uh, they use a line that says that love cannot remain silent. And I agree with Ray Comfort on that. We, we cannot be silent on this subject as Christians. We need to be sharing the gospel with those who are lost, including homosexuals, and to do it, as Scripture says, with respect and gentleness. I've seen different clips on the internet, on YouTube, of different street preachers. I've seen some who are very mean towards homosexuals in how they open-air preach, and I've seen some who are very loving, who are not lambasting, but pointing them to the gospel. And so, the latter approach is the approach we need to have. We, yes, speak the truth in love, and to do it, as Scripture says, with gentleness and respect. I'm going to play for you in just a moment here a clip from Todd Friel. And I think it's an excellent clip that kind of shows in how some Christians have responded not really well, but another one in how a Christian would like to respond to homosexuals. And so I'm going to play that clip for you right now. I'd like to share with you two letters. David Murray found a letter on the web, on, on the internet that made its way around about five years ago. Reg Bark is the guy's name. He came out to his father, who claims to be a Christian. This man, gay, told dad he's gay. And this is the letter that he says his dad wrote to him. This is letter number one. James, this is a difficult but necessary letter to write. I hope your telephone call was not to receive my blessing for the degrading of your lifestyle. I have fond memories of our times together, but that is all in the past. Don't expect any conversations with me, no communication at all. I will not come to visit, nor do I want you in my house. You've made your choice. Though wrong it may be, God did not intend for this unnatural lifestyle. If you choose not to attend my funeral, my friends and family will understand. Have a good birthday and good life. No present exchanges will be accepted. Goodbye, Dad. It's one letter. David Murray read that, and he decided to imagine that if his son came out to him, what letter would he would hope to write to his son? Here it is. My dear James, I'd rather say this man to man and face to face, and I hope you will have a chance to do so soon to avoid misunderstanding and to ensure that you will have something in black and white you can keep and refer to. I want to make sure you know one thing. I love you and I will always love you. I do not hate you and I never will. Our relationship will probably change a bit as a result of your chosen lifestyle. But my love for you will never change. I will continue to seek your very best as I have always done. In fact, I will probably be by other practical means, seek your good as I've never done before. Maybe you've been afraid that I will reject you and throw you out of my life. I want you to know you will always be welcome in our family and in our home. Text, email, phone, regularly, I will. This might be controversial. Your male friend may also come to visit home with you, but you will need to discuss certain boundaries. For example, I can't allow you to share a room or a bed together when you are here. I will not allow open displays of affection for one another, especially in front of the other children. If you stay with us, you'll attend family devotions. And if you're with us on a Sunday, you will come to church with us to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You hear that? Perhaps these boundaries are not going to go easy, and you won't accept them. But please try to understand that I have a duty to God to lead my home in a God-glorifying manner. Psalm 101 commands me to prevent sinful behavior in my home. While extremely anxious to preserve a relationship with you, I am especially concerned that your siblings are not influenced into thinking your lifestyle is fine with God or with us. Hear it? I know you don't like me calling your lifestyle and sexual practices a sin. However, remember, I've always told you that I myself am a greater sinner, but I have an even greater Savior. 
And I hope the day will come when you will seek that great Savior for yourself. He can wash us white as snow. He is able to deliver us from the bondage of our lusts and from everlasting damnation. I will not bring up your sin and the gospel every time we meet, but I do want you to know where I stand up front and that I'm willing to speak with you about the gospel of Christ any time you wish. I hope you will not call this message hate. This is how love sounds. I will always be your dad, and you will always be my son, and I will never stop loving you, and I will never stop praying for you. With all my love, Dad. I hear those two letters, and the first one saddens me that we as Christians can have that kind of attitude. The second letter brings joy to me to think of the possibilities of that if all of us as Christians were to act in that way to homosexuals, how would that maybe possibly change your minds to want to know the Savior? So how are we to treat homosexuals as Christians? I want to share with you five points on how I believe scripturally we're supposed to treat homosexuals. The first one I already mentioned is don't be silent. We need to love the person, and that means we need to warn the person. Here's what a few passages tell us about that warning the person. First, Galatians 5, 19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul, in the last sentence here of verse 21, says this very important thing. I warn you, as I warned you before. Paul is reminding the church in Galatians the importance of living a holy, righteous life. So he was warning them. It's a reminder to us, as Paul did, to warn the homosexuals of what their lifestyle does. Ezekiel 3.18 says, For if I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked with, from his wicked way, in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity. But listen to this. But his blood I will require at your hand. If we love the homosexual, we can't be silent. We must warn them of what, not only the sin of homosexuality, all of their sin, how that leads to death and eternity and hell. So if we don't warn people about their state, their blood is on our hands. Second way we should treat homosexuals is to share the gospel. First point, warning it. The second part of that is to share the gospel. Use the law to steer from homosexual issues. Every time I go out and share the gospel, I find the topic of homosexuality doesn't come up. If it's clear that the person is a homosexual, you don't need to go into that subject, really. Just deal with the whole issue of sin. I've shared the story of when I first went, first time I went up to the beach to share the gospel. The first one I shared the gospel with was a homosexual. And I had asked him the question of, have, has he ever lusted after another woman, as Jesus has told us not to lust after women, and that's adultery in our hearts. And his response was, well, actually, I'm gay. So I changed the question then and said, well, have you ever lusted after another person then? See, I didn't address the homosexual issue. I just addressed lust generally. So as Jesus' standard is, if we lust at someone other than our spouse, our opposite gender spouse... Outside of context, it's wrong. So we need to use the law to steer away from the homosexual issue. Romans 10 verse 1 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news! But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? 
So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This passage again reminds us that we must share the gospel. Our actions alone are not enough. We much pre much must preach the gospel. So we need to share the gospel with the homosexual. It is a loving thing to do. The third point for us is to be gracious. We are to treat the homosexual like any other sinner. A person who needs the gospel message. Paul says in Colossians 4 verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to to answer each person. I think that's an important reminder for us to speak with grace to all people who are not saved. Well, really for everyone for that matter, we're sp supposed to speak graciously to all people. Even in our rebukes of other brothers and sisters in Christ, we're to do it with grace. The word gracious here is the Greek word charis which means delight, or favor, or even a benefit. We see this is the same grace that God bestows upon us. He delights in us because He created us. And He shows His favor to us, His unmerited favor, by dying on the cross for our sins. And therein lies the benefit, that if we accept His gift of salvation, we receive the benefit of salvation, being saved from our sins, being released from the consequences of our sins, eternity in hell, and thus then gaining heaven and eternity with God face to face. That's grace. We too need to speak to people with that same kind of grace. So we treat the homosexual like any other sinner. They're no worse than any other sinner. In fact, they're just like we were before we were saved. Same state. So we need to treat them like any other sinner. Fourthly, be calm and preach the gospel. We often see bumper stickers around that says, keep calm and chive on, or, or some other kind of phrase with that. It's, I think it's a good reminder for us as Christians to keep calm and preach the gospel. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Oftentimes, when homosexuals are confronted with the gospel, they often will get angry. They don't like to hear that their lifestyle is a sin. They become very militant, in fact, about that subject. But here's a reminder for us, that when we share the gospel, keep calm and speak calmly to them. Because when we speak softly to them, it does turn away wrath. Number five, don't burn bridges. We don't want to burn bridges with anyone. We want to be able to have the lines of communication open with them, to share the gospel with them, to warn them of their, how their sins lead them towards eternal punishment in hell. Ephesians 4 verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That's how we keep from burning bridges when we are kind to each other and we're, we're tender-hearted. Paul is really speaking here in regards to our relationship with other Christians, but I think we can apply this too to the non-Christian and how we treat them. Keep from burning bridges with them. There's an interesting word here, it's tender-hearted, that Paul uses. This, the Greek word for this means compassionate. Compassionate is, means you see someone in a state that needs help and you, do, and you help them. This is an important for, thing for us to do, is to do something for them. And that's, again, to preach the gospel to them, but to do it, as we said before, with gentleness and graciousness. We remember to treat homosexuals like anyone else, like we've mentioned before. Because they need to hear the gospel message. They really are no different than you and I. We all struggle with some kind of temptation. All sinners, before they became saved, were involved in different kind of sins. So we need to see the homosexual 
in a way that God does. As a person who is in need of the gift of salvation. I believe if we follow these five points that we can be more effective in sharing the gospel with homosexuals and loving them as God loves them. Yes, it's true that God hates the sin. Yes, we need to hate the sin too. But we need to love the sinner. We need to speak the truth to them with love and with grace so that they see in our actions and interaction with them that there's something different about us then they'll be able to see that we truly do love them. As I said before, it's, it's our job to give the message. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict them. But let our actions not get in the way of the Holy Spirit's work. May we treat the, homo, he, treat the homosexual with love. Well, thank you again for joining us on the program today. Next program... I'm going to be sharing some witness encounters I've had this past summer as I've gone to a couple of different places to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You won't want to miss that. Until next time, this is Pastor Kevin reminding you to preach the gospel to any person, anywhere, anytime, at no matter the cost. You have been listening to the Gospel Activist Podcast, a ministry of Stepping Out Ministries. To submit a question for Pastor Kevin to answer on the podcast, visit us at www.steppingoutministries.com slash podcast.html. Thank you for listening, and we invite you to join us for our next podcast.